Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here, and we're gonna be talking about mutations in this video. And so we're gonna be covering a ton of information, including the differences in expression of genes that account for some of the phenotypic differences between organisms. And then we're also gonna talk about the process of genetic information is imperfect, and it is the source of genetic variation. And then ultimately how that has an impact on the ability to survive and reproduce. So let's get right to it. So first up, let's talk about types of mutations. So generally we're gonna group our mutations into two broad types, gene mutations and chromosome mutations. We talk about gene mutations. What that means is that we're looking at changes on the DNA level. We have a sequence of DNA. And if we have a change to that DNA that then causes a change in the mRNA that's produced, then that will lead to a different protein that is being produced. As a result of changes at the DNA level, we ultimately make a different protein. Now, the truth is, is there is a form of these mutations where we can change the DNA level, which would be a mutation, but we don't make a different protein in the case of a silent mutation. That is the exception to the rule, but generally on gene mutations, we are changing at the DNA level and that ultimately um, has an impact on what the mRNA sequence is and then possibly the protein that is produced as a result. Now, chromosome mutations, these are where in the larger chromosomal structure, we end up seeing either a section gets lost completely or deleted, or a section gets duplicated, or a mutation leads to inversion where a region of a chromosome gets flipped over. The chromosome possibly crosses over on itself and it flips the directionality. We can also have an insertion where a portion of one chromosome is moved over to another chromosome. And again, these are through non-homologous pairs. So so this could be a form of crossing over between non-homologous chromosomes. We also could have translocation where a region from one end of a chromosome gets swapped with the end of another and that leads to two new chromosomes as a result of that. And so in each one of these sections, we're changing not just a single gene, we're changing whole sets of genes, whole areas of chromosomes. These tend to be very profound. We do know that from looking at comparative chromosomes of closely related species, there do appear to be chromosome mutations associated with some speciation events. More often than not, this is going to be a profound impact that's going to lead to very significant genetic disease or genetic medical condition. But there are instances where we can see forms of these chromosome mutations may have played a role in speciation at one time in the past. All right, so changes in the genotype can result in changes in phenotype. So obviously the function and the amount of a gene products determines the phenotype of the organism. So if we have a mutation and it suddenly becomes a nonsense mutation and now we stop making that protein, well, that's gonna have an impact. Now, depending on what the phenotype is and depending on the environmental conditions, it's gonna have a vast different impact on different types of organisms. Also, the normal function of the gene and the gene product collectively comprises the normal function of organisms. So if we assume that the original protein that was made from the no mutation is sort of normal functions, is part of normal survivability, we're going to be comparing all to that. There are instances where the loss of the production of a particular protein, if that protein is not core to surviving and reproducing, may actually lead to an energetic advantage. So I would say that there is going to be some variability that takes place there. The other thing is that disruptions in genes and gene products will cause a new phenotype. So now all of a sudden you have an organism that is making a new pigment, not making a particular pigment, making a different pigment. This is going to lead to variation. This is going to be adding in a new phenotype potentially to a gene pool. And then this is now the raw material for which natural selection can act. So alterations of the DNA sequence that lead to changes in the type or the amount of protein produced and the consequences of those phenotypes, again, we, we have this general idea or most people have the misconception that mutations are bad. Mutations are neither positive or negative as a rule. Some can be positive. Some can be negative. Some, like a silent mutation, totally neutral based on the effect or the lack of effect they have on the resulting nucleic acid or the protein and the phenotypes that are conferred by that protein. There are also instances where, again, the loss of a particular protein may not have an impact on survivability. And so if that's the instance, just because we have a nonsense mutation doesn't mean that the loss of every single protein is crucial. And so there have been examples where over time, we see the loss of the production of certain proteins in organisms, and there is no survivability impact. 
So how can changes in genotype result in changes in phenotype? Well, as I mentioned before, the DNA sequence is going to provide the template which we're going to use to make mRNA through transcription. If the DNA sequence has changed, we're going to make a different mRNA. When that mRNA goes out to the ribosome, we're going to ultimately bring in a different amino acid as part of our protein. We can see that in the process of the formation of normal hemoglobin versus sickle cell hemoglobin. In the sequence CTT that's in normal hemoglobin, we have an mRNA that then leads to a specific amino acid of glutamic acid. That glutamic acid is lost, and as a result, now we end up producing a CAT on DNA, a GUA for our mRNA, and that leads to the production of valine. Now, the change in this leads to a different shaped protein, and when that protein folds up, it has an impact on the overall shape of red blood cells. So the phenotype of the red blood cells, the physical appearance of the red blood cell is tied to the change in the shape of the protein. And when that protein is folded up, it leads to a different shape molecule, which ultimately impacts the shape of the red blood cell overall. Now, errors in DNA replication or DNA repair mechanisms and external factors, including radiation, interacting with reactive chemicals or random mutations in DNA, those can be detrimental, beneficial, neutral, depending on the environmental context. We've already talked about that. I'm going to dive into some of the detrimental impacts and how that impacts um, overall living things. We know that if you have damaged DNA, just because DNA is damaged does not actually mean that we're going to lead to a, a mutation overall in those cells. Cells actually have very strong selective pressure in order to repair those DNA damage. So what we know is that when DNA is damaged, if it's a non-replicating cell, we actually undergo a process of DNA repair and try to actively repair and return cells to normal function. Now, what's not shown in this diagram is what happens if the DNA damage actually happens to germline cells. Germline cells are the ones that lead to sperm or egg. When they're going to sperm or egg, these are the ones that are going to impact whether or not these mutations will have an impact on future generations. So whether a mutation is detrimental, be uh, beneficial, or neutral depends on the environmental context. So when an environment selects it, but it's also really important on what type of tissue in the body is impacted by this mutation. And if the mutations happen to germ cells, then we're going to get a change in the DNA structure that's passed on to the next generation. And that's going to provide some variation to the population that that individual has and will be able to contribute to. Sometimes it will be beneficial. Sometimes it will be neutral. Sometimes it will be harmful. Again, that will depend on the environment. So errors in mitosis or meiosis can result in changes in the phenotype. So Again, changes in the chromosome number result in new phenotypes, including sterility caused by triploidy and also increase in vigor of other polyploidies. So one of the things that we know is that when there's an error in the chromosome number, particularly in meiosis, you can have a situation such as changes in the chromosome number that leads to a human disorder like trisomy 21 or Down syndrome or Turner syndrome. And that's a case where one individual produces a gamete that lacks a sex chromosome and the other partner provides an X chromosome. So that's an individual who's born only with one X chromosome and no second sex chromosome. In those instances of both Down syndrome or Turner syndrome, those are individuals who are going to be able to survive and develop, but they are often going to have issues with producing their own viable gametes. When they go to undergo meiosis in their germ lines, the number of chromosomes is not going to be a normal number. That is not to say that an individual with Down syndrome or individual with Turner syndrome does not have the ability to produce viable gametes, but they do have more challenge because on average, half of the gametes they produce are going to have an abnormal number of chromosomes associated with them. That abnormal number reduces their fertility dramatically, and that reduction in fertility could have the practical impact of a loss of fertility. We also know that going back to step A, many plants undergo processes of polyploidy. And so, for example, modern day bananas, modern day bananas have multiple copies of their genes that are found in modern day bananas. And they are polyploidy where they have made multiple copies of the entire genome. This is a much more common process that we see in plants than animals. But there are actually a few examples of polyploidy animals where during evolution, an organism had an error in meiosis and produced gametes that actually had double the number of chromosomes in those cells, but were able to successfully have fertilization and lead to successful young. And it actually led to a form of 
sympatric speciation for that grouping because now that chromosome number is different than the general population it came from. All right, so how does this alteration in DNA sequence contribute to the variation that can lead to natural selection? So what we know is that the process of natural selection involves two key components. One, we have to have variation in the population. So you have an initial population, they produce young, and those young look different from one another. The variation that's in that population is then going to go out to the environment, and then the selective pressure that takes place in that environment is going to have an impact on how well those individuals can survive and reproduce. I have an image over here of a rock pocket mouse, a dark colored rock pocket mouse, a dark brown one. And so what we can see is the original population of rock pocket mice actually had some variation, everything from very dark brown to like very light tan in color. Now on this darkish brown dirt, what we can see is that the mutation creates the variation and then there's going to be selective pressure uh, applied in this case by predators. The lighter colored mice on this darker background are going to stand out and therefore they're going to be selected against. And so those unfavorable mutations are in this case selected against by predators. And so those that have the very light fur are less likely to survive and reproduce and have offspring. Now variation doesn't disappear. That next generation is still going to have variation. But the selective pressure that's going to happen over time is going to be against those that do not blend into that environment. And so over time, the more favorable mutations or the more favorable phenotypes are going to be selected for. And those that have those phenotypes that are most successful in the environment are going to survive and reproduce. And we will see a shift in the population towards those favorable genotypes over time. So... Changes in the genotype can affect the phenotypes that are subject to, subject to natural selection. We can see that genetic changes enhance survival and reproduction, and they can be selected for by those environmental conditions. Another example of that could be the horizontal acquisition of genetic information in prokaryotes, and specifically the taking up of uh, DNA through either transformation or through transduction, where a virus actually infects and puts the DNA into a cell from one to the other, or conjugation, the sharing of a plasmid from one to the next, or what we see, transposition, which is the movement of a DNA segment within DNA molecules, and that happens within a genome. That's more of a eukaryotic phenomenon that what we end up seeing as opposed to a prokaryotic phenomenon. In all of these instances, what we're going to see is the genes being inserted into a genome and that if those genes provide a phenotype that's an advent uh, an advantage within the population we're going to end up seeing that future generations are more likely to have those particular genes and more likely to have those phenotypes all right, we also know that when we talk about changes of genotype, we know that related viruses can actually combine or recombine genetic information if they infect the same host cells. This has been seen many, many times by flu. Um, it has not been seen in coronaviruses yet, uh, to our knowledge, although it probably happens in reservoir species out in the wild. We have not seen it happen in humans. But we do know that um, because there are many different types of flu that happen in pigs and birds and all kinds of different species out there that they can get at. There's horse flus. All kinds of different species can get forms of influenza that if you have an individual that happens to get infected by two different types of flu. So for example, they get a highly pathogenic avian flu strain or a bird flu strain, and they get sort of the seasonal human flu strain that's been uh, floating around, you will actually produce a new strain of flu. This has happened a few different times with flu pandemics, where novel combinations of two existing flu uh, strains come together in a host, and you will actually see an uptick in flus of this novel type that lead to pandemic flu. And so this has happened. We've had a handful of times over the last hundred years where pandemic flu has come about. And in almost every instance, the pandemic flu arose from this recombining of two forms of flu into a novel host, and then that novel host spreading it to other individuals. Again, this could happen in a human. It could also happen in a bird. It could happen in a pig. Um, it's one of the reasons why flu is so variable. And we've seen these various pandemic versions of flu over time. All right, so you may ask yourself, how does changes in the genotype affect the phenotype and subjects of natural selection? And maybe let's look at an example of that. So reproduction processes that increase genetic variation 
are evolutionarily conserved and are shared amongst various organisms. So what we can see here is we know that natural selection involves certain specific processes, variation that occurs in the original population, overproduction, which means more offspring are going to be produced than can survive, selection processes such as uh, predators coming in, and then reproduction. So what's not shown in this case is that reproduction often involves displays of fitness that we can see in living things. So for example, I think the best example of this tends to be the peacock. And so if there is a form of sexual selection within birds where there is a visual display, such as that of a peacock, or some other mating ritual or form of a sexual selection, if there is a process, while on its surface mating seem more elaborate, but is able to display fitness in that original population, that will then be a signal that uh, that one individual is a more fit member of the population to mate with and can pass that along to the next generation. And so why do we see sexual selection so broadly in many different types of living things? There seems to be a strong evolutionary pressure in order to be able to display fitness as part of a reproduction process in evolution. All right, that was a lot of stuff about mutations leading to variation and how variation leads to evolution. Uh, hopefully that was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.